What is the greatest Christmas movie ever made? This is a question that has yet to receive a single definitive answer ever since Socrates first proposed it to his fellow scholars in Plato's book, The Republic. Some have argued that it's Home Alone 2, starring the brother of that one guy from Succession. Others have argued that it's Jingle All the Ways 2, starring Mater from Planes. Or maybe you're one of those men of culture who claims that the Santa Claus 2 deserves the title. And then, of course, of course, there are the virgin basement dwelling nerds who claim that these films are the greatest Christmas movies of all time. Now obviously we don't need to take those opinions seriously because the type of people who say movies like It's a Wonderful Life or Die Hard are the best Christmas movies are also the types of people who would like something disgusting like, I don't know, anime. Anime is for children and perverts. However, what we do need to take seriously is this important, controversial question. What is the greatest Christmas movie ever made? Well, today, this debate ends once and for all because after years of scientific research, study, and analysis, I have concluded that the greatest Christmas movie of all time is the 2007 masterpiece, Fred Claus, directed by legendary filmmaker David Dobkin, best known for his classic pieces of trailblazing cinema like Wedding Crashers, The Judge, and Eurovision Song Contest, that one weird movie with Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Fred Claus is truly one of the movies ever made. It is so good, in fact, that I recently deemed it worthy of being a barnyard-level film. And if you've seen my barnyard video, then you know just how big of a deal Fred Claus is. Don't believe me? Well, just ask Hollywood legend and Wes Anderson white boy number 645, Jared Gilman as it is one of his favorite films ever made. But enough about Jared, we need to talk about Fred, as this is without a doubt one of the most challenging and artistically ambitious films I have ever talked about on this channel. Don't be fooled by this poster. It may seem like a goofy Christmas comedy about Vince Vaughn learning how to ride a tricycle for the first time, all while being judged by his Asian tiger dad, Paul Giamatti. But in reality though, Fred Claus is actually one of the most complex nuanced, experimental, avant-garde, surrealist art house indie films I have ever seen, and by the time you finish this video, you will understand why. So the film begins in the Middle Ages, where we witness the birth of Santa Claus, and within three seconds of his existence, he is immediately fat-shamed. Baby, I've ever seen. Incredible. Right off the bat, the film dives deep into its first theme, obesity and struggles one has with coping with it. This single clip already serves as a poignant commentary on the subject, and it's no wonder why future art house movies like Mary and Max and The Whale took inspiration from Fred Claus, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, immediately after he's born, our main hero in Sigma Chad, Fred, promises to be the best big brother ever, only to immediately go back on this promise after he discovers that Nick is a complete beta male. This leads to one of the most powerful and influential lines in the entire film, but also possibly in all of writing. Quote, I don't hate him, I just wish he was never born. Keep that in your brains, ladies and gentlemen, because this is what the experts call foreshadowing. Anyway, Nick then cuts down a tree, causing Fred to cry and run away because at this point in the story, he has established himself as a hardcore environmentalist while his younger brother has sold his soul to the capitalist machine of destroying Mother Nature for the sake of increasing profits and revenue. It's no wonder Dr. Seuss was inspired by Fred Claus when he was writing The Lorax, because believe it or not, that book is a complete one-for-one -one remake of this opening sequence of Fred Claus. But that's not important. What is important is the next scene, where we fast forward to the year 2007, in which we now see an adult Fred Claus, played by noted good actor in True Detective Season 2, Vince Vaughn, living as an average citizen in my old college town of Chicago, Illinois. Now I'm going to admit, 
As much as I think this film is a perfect masterpiece, I do have one small issue with the movie, and it's this ridiculous time skip. You see, the movie more or less confirms that the clauses are immortal, or at the very least age much slower than the average human like dwarves from Lord of the Rings. And according to historians, the original Saint Nicholas, who inspired the legend of Santa Claus, was a monk born around 280 CE. Therefore, if we are to assume that Fred Claus is a historically accurate film, and why wouldn't it be, then it is implied that this version of Santa was born around the same time. By using math, we can then deduce that within the timeline of this film, Santa is 2,287 years old, meaning that Fred is at least 2,292 years old, give or take, since it is heavily implied that Fred is roughly five years older than Nick. Now given how old both Fred and Nick are, this means that the two brothers have witnessed nearly 2,300 years of world history, and as a noted history buff, I can't help but wonder about the potential that was lost when Fred Claus was being developed. Considering how old the two men are, I can't help but ask, where were Fred and Nick during the fall of the Western Roman Empire? How did they react to Charlemagne becoming the Holy Roman Emperor? How did they survive the Black Death? Were they involved in any of the Crusades? Based on Fred and Nick's apparent American accents, it's clear that they immigrated to the US at some point. But when exactly did this happen? Did they travel with Christopher Columbus in 1492 when he sailed the ocean blue and helped him initiate the mass genocide of the indigenous American population? Or did they arrive to the New World much earlier with Leif Erikson and his Viking tribe? Were they one of the first colonists to arrive at the colony of Jamestown or Massachusetts Bay Colony? Did they fight in the American Revolution? And if so, which side did they fight in? Did they fight in the American Civil War? And if so, which one was the pro-slavery racist? Did Nick become Santa Claus because he was a captain of industry slash robber baron like Andrew Carnegie and Cornelius Vanderbilt? Did Nick engage in 19th century imperialism that allowed him to build a colony in the North Pole and subjugate the native elves living there? Where were Nick and Fred during the other major American wars like World War I, II, and Vietnam. As you can clearly see, there is so much lore within the world of Fred Claus that is unlike any other fictional universe. Like you thought Lord of the Rings and Dune had expansive and detailed fictional universes? Those are small fry compared to the rich world building that is etched deep into the greater narrative of Fred Claus. Why settle for fake fantasy and sci-fi bullshit made by dweebs who probably never got laid when you have 2300 years of world history at your disposal. It's disappointing that Fred Claus never got an expansive cinematic universe like Marvel has because this film is ripe for a franchise that could go on till the end of time. Might I suggest potential sequels like Fred Claus and The Patriot, The Last of the Clauses, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and The Claws, Saving Private Claus, and keep in mind this is all just phase one of the FCU, or Fred Claus Cinematic Universe. So David Zaslav, if you're watching this video and you finally realize that your dumbass DC Universe isn't working out and you're tired of people making fun of all the stupid decisions you've made at Warner Brothers, then call my phone number right now, hire me, and let's jumpstart the FCU. This mega franchise that within 10 years will earn 69 billion dollars at the box office. Make me the Kevin Feige of the FCU. Give me money and I will build you an empire. Do it, pussy. Anyway, where was I? Oh, right, the plot. So, after a grown-up Fred gives some enlightening advice about the harsh realities of life to this small child, we then transition to Fred catcalling a female police officer named Wanda. Now, as a former resident of Chicago, normally when you do this, you get the shit beaten out of you and then sent to prison for a couple of years. But because Fred is a white man, the female cop simply blushes and is charmed by him. 
Oh, and they're also dating or whatever. Anyway, in this scene, we get a glimpse into just how awesome of a boyfriend Fred is. One, he leaves the country for days after Wanda, played by Rachel Weisz for some reason, asks to move into her apartment. Two, he forgets Wanda's birthday. And three, tricked Wanda into learning French thinking that they were going to Paris, when in reality, she just took him gambling on a boat in my hometown of Indiana. What a fucking Chad. No wonder Andrew Tate and Joe Rogan look up to this guy because he's a top G. So anyway, after this scene, we are then introduced to Fred's best friend, a small orphan named Slam, who tells Fred that he wants a dog named Macaroni for Christmas. Cringing at both this gift idea and the name, Fred proceeds to shit talk Santa and tell him that he's an overrated hack, which Slam takes to heart, I guess, and is not weirded out by Fred's weird hatred towards Santa. Whatever. After that that purposeful scene, we then discover that Fred is trying to start an illegal gambling ring in the heart of downtown Chicago, and to fund his noble and totally legitimate crusade, he decides to pretend to be a Salvation Army Santa, and despite embracing his role as the average working man, he is assaulted by a League of Santas who obviously represent the woke Democrats trying to steal jobs away from the working man and give it to the evil foreigners. This leads to one of the most most epic fight scenes I've ever witnessed in my short life. Like, so epic that this rivals the Ben vs. Coyote scene from Barnyard. Anyway, after Fred gets his ass kicked by the League of Evil Santas, he's thrown in jail despite absolutely doing nothing wrong, and with nowhere left to go, he calls his younger brother, Nicholas Claus, aka Santa, aka Big Red, to bail him out. However, because Nick is both a hardcore capitalist and an absolute cut, Fuck. Nick offers Fred a deal. He will give Fred enough money to both bail him out and pay for his illegal gambling, a combined total of $50,000 if he comes to the North Pole and offers himself as free labor. Fred is hesitant at first, but just like every child laborer, the man didn't have a choice. Anyway, after Fred rats on Slam for being an orphan, he gets picked up by a beta elf named Willy, and you'll see why later in this video, and together they travel to the North Pole, where he's a attacked by elf secret service members, all because he's a tall girl. It's 2007, and we're still discriminating people based on height. Way to go, America. Or I guess in this case, North Pole, but whatever, not important. What is important is that in the next scene, Nick puts his brother to work by tasking Fred with the responsibility of deciding whether each kid in the entire world is either nice or naughty, which basically makes him both a secretary and a judge at the same time. Anyway, while Fred attempts to be a model employee, he unfortunately is unable to do his job diligently because the radio keeps playing the same song, Here Comes Santa Claus, over and over again. Frustrated by this first world problem, Fred goes to the radio room and confronts DJ Donnie, aka Short Tedge, aka the only black elf in the North Pole. That last one wasn't even a joke. That's a literal fact. Out of all these child-sized laborers working at Santa's workshop, DJ Donnie is the only black elf in the community. So not only is there only one black elf in all of Santa's workshop, but he also doesn't even get the opportunity to make toys himself. Nah, fuck that. Instead, he is simply delegated to playing music for the White Elves. So basically, DJ Donnie's only purpose is to play music and simply be entertainment for the White Elves who actually get to make toys. Way to go, Nick. What is this, 1920s? Oh yeah, and on top of all of that, it's heavily implied that there's racial segregation in the North Pole. Because in this scene, while Fred is trying to restrain DJ J. Donnie, Short Tej says this. I'm from the south side of the North Pole, man. DJ Donnie is from the south side of the North Pole. Let that rub in. It's 2007, and Nick is still either blatantly maintaining a racially segregated elf society like pre-1960s America, or he is subtly yet legally maintaining a racially segregated elf society like post-1960s America, specifically modern-day Chicago, which also happens to be where Fred lives. Coincidence? I think not. What's particularly fascinating about this scene, though, is that despite it being on the surface a funny, comedic scene, 
about Fred mansplaining music to a black elf. It is actually an incredibly subtle yet poignant commentary about modern day race relations in America that clearly still transpire today. It is such a brave and authentic takedown on racial segregation and bias, and it is so powerful that both Spike Lee and Jordan Peele speak fondly of Fred Claus today as a modern classic in black film history. Now before I go on another tangent, let's get back to the most important thing, the plot. Now I'm gonna skip through most of what happens because like I've said, this movie is an incredibly dense, complex, and rich narrative that requires a five hour long video to break down this film frame by frame in detail and I have things I need to do today, but here are the most important things to know. Fred throws a rave. He's forced to have dinner with his judgmental parents. Fred goes to an elvish pub and teaches Willie how to dance so that he can get Elizabeth Banks a see. And then Fred is forced to go through an intervention hosted by Nick, the brother's parents, and Wanda, who A, was somehow persuaded and transported to the North Pole. B, is totally cool with the fact that not only is Santa real, but is the brother of the man she's dating. And C, is being called out by Fred for being a slut, for rejecting Negan's offer to have dinner together, because that's how that works, I guess. And Anyway, so let's focus on arguably the most important character in the second and third act of Fred Claus, besides our title character, IRS agent Clyde Archibald Northcutt, played by noted good person Kevin Spacey. Northcutt is not only one of the most interesting and compelling characters in all of Fred Claus lore, but he is also one of the most terrifying villains in all of movie history. I mean, he works for the IRS for crying out loud, an organization so scary that not even the Joker baby will mess with. And Northcutt is a pure embodiment of not just the IRS, but America's worst vices. This is by far the most evil character that Kevin Spacey has ever played, a hundred times more sinister than his second most evil character, Kevin Spacey. But we don't need to talk about Kevin, we're here to talk about Northcutt. Now at first glance, he seems like any other stereotypical bad guy. I mean, he financially ruined ruined and brought down the Easter Bunny for crying out loud. If that's not evil, I don't know what is. I mean, he's so evil that he manipulates Fred into becoming a full-blown communist by manipulating him into labeling every kid in the world as nice, thereby causing him to embrace his inner Karl Marx by radically proposing that everyone, regardless of their social status, deserves a piece of the pie. And in Santa's uber-capitalist society, commie bullshit is a no-go. Fred's decision to make every kid nice infuriates Nick so much that it eventually leads to this tragic, heartbreaking, but most importantly, epic snowball fight between Nick and Fred, where Fred continues to fat shame Nick, and Nick continues to be a pathetic beta male. Remember earlier in the video where I said the quote, I don't hate him, I just wish he was never born, would become more important later in the film? Well, I hope you locked that in your brains and stored it in your adult diapers earlier like I said, because this is how it's beautifully and hauntingly reincorporated right after Fred and Nick's fight. You hate me. I don't hate you, Nick. I just wish you were never born. I'm literally creaming my pants right now because of how good it is. And you thought Quentin Tarantino was a good writer. Fucking hack. He could never write anything as compelling as Fred Claus. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. This fight and Fred's decision to give every kid a nice pass finally gives Northcutt his last justification to shut down Santa's workshop for good. And to show how evil he is, he laughs as he finally witnesses the demise of Christmas. But if we've learned anything so far, it's that Santa's the uber capitalist who is willing to do whatever it takes to keep his factory running. And he's not going to let something pesky like government intervention ruin his free market dreams. Unfortunately, 
Because Nick threw out his back and Fred is feeling guilty for all the stuff he allegedly did, hashtag Fred's up, Fred decides to use the $50,000 he would have spent on his illegal gambling rig to return to the North Pole and restart Santa's workshop. However, rather than embracing his brother's strict capitalist ideas and philosophy, Fred instead employs what I like to call the China slash Vietnam approach, and that he claims to champion communist beliefs by claiming that every single child, regardless of what they've done or their social status, deserves a Christmas present. So basically, Fred's kind of like these guys. However, Fred also proposes that to satisfy everyone, he'll use his slave labor force to produce super cheap products so that he can technically fulfill that promise of every kid getting a present, when really, He's cutting corners to satisfy the market, kind of like what these guys are doing. Fred then proceeds to reinforce gender stereotypes by asking the elves what the cheapest and easiest presents to make are for boys and girls, to which they reply, a baseball bat for boys and future racists, and a hula hoop for girls and a young Joel and Ethan Cohen, who would be inspired by this scene to make their 1994 masterpiece, the Hudsucker Proxy. Using the China slash Vietnam approach, Fred produces enough presents, steps up to deliver the toys himself, and then proceeds to gorge himself in what appears to be over 10,000 calories worth of milk, cookies, and food given to him by this Jewish family. And despite Fred stating no less than 20 minutes ago that the only presents that will be delivered are baseball bats and hula hoops, he still somehow has the time to get that stupid dog named Macaroni for his stupid orphan friend, but none of that shit is important. What is important is that right when Fred is about to be home free, the workshop is shut down again by that dreaded bastard, Northcutt, and says to the elves, You're taking a bus back to Elphistan or wherever the hell you're from. <laughs> However, right when all hope is lost, Nick finally gets off his fat ass and confronts Northcutt, claiming that he knows why he's being a complete dick. He tells Northcutt that he's still mad at Santa for not giving him a Superman cape for Christmas that one time when he was a kid, and apparently not getting that cape was such a huge freaking dealio that he dedicated his entire life to becoming an IRS agent with the sole purpose of bringing down Santa once and for all. So he basically has the exact same motivations as Syndrome from The Incredibles and Guy Pierce from Iron Man 3. So make what you will with this genius level of writing. Anyway, to make amends with his mistake, Santa gives Northcutt the Superman cape he had wanted all those years ago, and despite being a man in his 40s, proudly wears it like a middle-aged nerd whining on the internet that Disney didn't invite him to the premiere of a movie that has space wizards, and how he busted his ass his whole life being a Star Wars fan. Anyway, I guess having this cape was just so profound that it causes Northcutt to do a complete 180 in his personality, and decides to not be a villain anymore, instead deciding to be a nice guy and help Fred deliver the last remaining presents. So basically, the moral of the story is that if a guy is evil, just make him wear nerd shit, and it will cause him to be a good guy instead. Also, before I forget, I should point out that Northcutt, wearing a Superman cape is obviously a reference to the classic superhero movie that Kevin Spacey appeared in, Batman Returns, WRONG! in which he played a goblin named Mantis Toboggan MD, Suicide is badass. a character who was so important to his career that he transferred parts of it to other characters he played, like Francis Underwood, Suicide is badass. and his most famous role, Kevin Spacey. Suicide is badass. Fred delivers the remaining presents on time, Willie kisses Elizabeth Banks without her consent, Northcutt becomes a McKinsey consultant for Santa's workshop, Fred takes takes Wanda to this weird CGI backdrop of Paris instead of actually taking her to Paris, and Fred and Nick finally live happily ever after. Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. This video is my gift to you.
And now the only thing I ask that you do for me this holiday season, in exchange, is to go on Twitter, write either hashtag release the Fred Claus Vaughn cut, or hashtag save the Fred Claus verse, and tag me on Twitter at Tim Jong Un 515. I doubt any of you will do this, but in case you do, you are doing God's work. Because at the end of the day, I not only want a sequel to this masterpiece of cinema, but I want 10 sequels. Thank you and goodbye.